What makes a good athlete? Size, strength, speed. In sports, you can add another S word, stats. Stats can bless us with the ability to objectively decide if something is good. It's what separates talking about baseball players from talking about good food or movies or comedy. Or if my impression of the Five Nights at Freddy's phone call guy is any good. Hello? 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 In theory, stats should be able to tell you if a baseball player is doing well. Until you meet the one guy who can divide everyone. The guy who stumps analytics. 2010, Elmer Descends. He was a 39-year-old relief pitcher for the Mets. And depending on where you look, his season was either really good or really bad. On the surface, there's almost no in-between. And that's because the stats that are available on that season conflict. They disagree on whether or not it was even a good one. It shouldn't be like that, but it is. I did a video very recently before this on, quote, the worst baseball player ever, based on the guy with the worst stats. It was actually my last video, I don't know why I just said very recently. And I consider this video to be a continuation of that one's main idea. I talked in that video about how even when stats can say you're a bad player, they don't tell the whole story. But, what if the stats can't even make up their mind on a guy? You ain't got the answers, man! You ain't got the answers! What we're gonna do here is lay out how these stats can and do disagree with each other and give you the tools to render a decision yourself. Was Elmer Descends good in 2010? Really quick though, this man is my guy right here. I'd say the average baseball fan's first pitching stat that they look at is ERA, which is essentially just how many runs a pitcher is responsible for giving up every nine innings. FIP is what a pitcher's ERA would be just on the things they can usually control. Strikeouts, walks, and home runs. Over the 47 innings he pitched, Elmer's ERA in 2010 was very good. His best since he was actually one of the better starting pitchers in baseball back in 2002. And it could have been even better. If he just didn't pitch on September 21st, he would have finished the season with an ERA around 170, which is really good. His FIP wasn't good at all. For his career, his ERA and FIP were actually identical, but this year, way, way off. Usually, a pitcher having their ERA way lower than their FIP implies that they got lucky. As a result, his ERA was roughly 71% above average compared to the environment around him. So looking at these two numbers isn't enough to tell you if he had a good year. Really wish Fangraphs had the expected ERA here, really could have helped. But what we do have is his expected FIP, even worse than what it ended up being, and more evidence of incredible luck. I talked about ERA and FIP discrepancies sometimes being fine back in the Marvin Freeman video, but this kind of difference in number is way beyond that. Okay, what about his war? Or the amount of games his team would have won with him instead of a replacement caliber pitcher? Baseball Reference has it at 1, Fangraphs at negative 0.3. So we're talking about a difference between usable and below replacement level, somehow. War can't even decide what it thinks of Elmer. He's a pitcher who went totally under the radar that season. If baseball Twitter was how it is today back in 2010, this debate could have ravaged through the at hoodie futenies of the day. Here's why he may have gone under the radar. From July 7th to August 16th, 2010, Elmer made 14 appearances. He gave up just three earned runs in that span. All 14 of those games wound up as Mets losses. Another thing people look at to evaluate luck is BABIP, or batting average on balls in play. 300 is usually about average, so about 30% of balls that get hit become hits. Elmer's was a really low 239. Whether or not that was luck or skill, it contributed to what I think is one of Elmer's most impressive stats that season. 84.6% of the runners on base while Elmer was pitching failed to score. That is absolutely elite. It's like Mariano Rivera, Trevor Hoffman, Josh Hader good. It's better than any rate Aroldis Chapman has had in the last six years. And he was on the mound for two triple plays last year. But you guys have never even heard of Elmer Descends. Wikipedia only mentions that this season existed. Nothing more, nothing less. All you guys talking about Elmer Descends ain't no hitter. Elmer Descends ain't this. Elmer Descends a fake. You want to know why? Because Elmer was a very, um, 
unsexy kind of pitcher. What people like to see out of pitchers, relievers especially, are a lot of strikeouts. It was almost like Elmer actively avoided striking guys out at any cost. His 16 strikeouts across those 47 innings in 2010 is tiny. It's lower than Richard Blyer's lowest strikeout rate in a season. And Richard Blyer is a guy known for not striking people out. It's so tiny that his 2010 teammate Ike Davis had a higher K per 9 pitching in 2015. Ike Davis was a first baseman. Over his whole career, Elmer was not a high strikeout guy at all. At his worst, he'd give up a hit twice as often as he'd strike someone out. He also had 16 total walks, although six of them were intentional. Having as many walks as strikeouts when you're a pitcher is not good. And with him being a good, but not elite, hit preventer, it led to a higher number of base runners than it should have. Even if his whip looks good on paper, I think you have to take this one with a grain of salt. Granted, those base runners didn't usually stay there for long, but it's best to just not even have them in a perfect world. Not very many strikeouts usually means a lot of balls put in play. And Elmer does have pretty great numbers for hitters against him. About 42% of the balls hit off Elmer were ground balls, which implies a lot of weak contact. All three of his batting average, on base percentage, and slugging percentage against are very low, which further shows that he was good at limiting damage. You want to know why Elmer didn't strike a lot of guys out, and also why the contact against him was usually weak. Relief pitchers today typically live close to 100 miles an hour on their fastball. Just 12 years ago, Elmer's average fastball was under 90. Even in 2010, only three years before Ice JJ Fish dropped on the floor, that was absolutely below average for a bullpen arm. And for a right-handed pitcher, that's extremely rare at the big league level. Most right-handed pitchers in college today are capable of that. And they still have to take, like, film theory and biology classes on the side. Elmer was a 14th year big leaguer by this point. You could say his lower velo was a result of him being 39 years old, but he hadn't ever been a high velocity guy in his career. As it relates to hitting against him, velo from the mound generates velo from the bat. Balls with higher exit velocities usually do more damage. So, without much velo from the pitch, the ball off the bat isn't going to be hit as hard as it would be on a faster pitch. That's the science behind it. And why A-Rod destroying this pitch is more unbelievable than it looks. Even with, you know, steroids. Here's a perfect example of how he combined weak contact with getting out of jams. On June 4th, Elmer comes in with a tying run at third base with two outs in the seventh inning to face Hanley Ramirez. Maybe the best hitting shortstop in all of baseball at this time. And a guy who finished second in the MVP race a year before this. He gets a weak pop out in foul ground to end the inning, and make the threat seem like nothing. No true wipeout pitch, a lot of balls in play stats that scream lucky, and a possible smoke and mirrors ERA. How could Elmer be good? I'll give you one stat that I think is the one that matters the most to me in this story. Because with all these conflicting numbers that go against each other, this one shows how effective he was. Elmer made 53 relief appearances for the Mets that season. He allowed an earned run in just seven of them. And just one of his five two or more inning relief appearances. That means your odds of him coming in and holding down the fort were pretty high. After this really weird season ended, Elmer never pitched in the major leagues again. Unable to stick with a team in the few years before the Mets, and never after 2010. He went the entire month of June without giving up a run. He carried a 193 ERA into mid-September, and was never seen again on a big league roster after that. Adding an equally strange close to a season that was a complete enigma. No one noticed it happening, but both traditional and advanced stats were being challenged by this season. Most of the good ones come with equally significant bad ones. Every stat feels like it has a catch to it. So what do you do when you can't use these kind of stats to evaluate a player? You simplify the problem. Watch them pitch. And in this case, ask yourself one question. Does he get outs? A team's 27 outs are their most prized possession. Here's Elmer coming into a game against the Pirates with runners on first and second and nobody out. On just four pitches, he sets down Chris Snyder, Brandon Moss, and Andrew McCutcheon three outs, and a possible go-ahead rally. Gone. Pitchers who can drain the other team's outs without giving up very many runs are guys you want to have. 
Elmer Desens did that for the 2010 Mets, but he'd never do it for any other team again. He never pitched in the big leagues again after that season. Baseball can be a weird game. <laughs> Pitchers come in all shapes and sizes. Elmer Desens didn't have overpowering stuff. He didn't have the best peripheral stats, and it seemed he got incredibly lucky at times. But there was a method to the madness, and I think it worked. Sometimes you gotta think outside the box in evaluating and finding good players. And the first couple stats you look at might not tell a whole story. He got outs and prevented runs from scoring. Pitchers are very hard to put into arbitrary boxes. And if you really break down baseball, that could be what matters the most. And as I stated in the video I touched on earlier, stats aren't one size fits all. I hope these stories put together act as a lesson of some kind. Don't judge a book by its cover. <laughs>